Okay. Isom. Here. Gage. Here. Coos. Here. Flora. Here. Sieverson. Here. Kiefer. Here. Singy. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 That brings us down to communications. I think we have a whole bunch of updates that we'll need to deal with when we get started into um, the general government. Um, if we could tackle probably some of these updates first, that'd be good. And that brings us to persons to be heard. Do we have anybody here to speak to the council tonight? Seeing none, we'll move out of persons to be heard. Brings us down to unfinished business. Resolution 162645, adopting the budget for the year 2017. General government. And then, Carl, did you want to do that rate study, uh, rate study presentation update first? I think that would make the most sense, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, go ahead. Who's bringing them up and introducing them? I'd like to uh, introduce Karen Johnson at FCF. We hired uh, her firm to update the May 2013 uh, water and wastewater rate study. Uh, the purpose of the update was to further expand on the council's desire to meter uh, certain large commercial customers and also to simplify the current first business uh, rate structure for small commercial customers, simplify it. And uh, Karen's here to make a presentation. Um, show you what she came up with. Could you point that microphone toward you? That would be very helpful. How's that? Everybody hear me okay? okay. All right. So a couple of the things that we wanted to focus today's discussion on for the rate study is looking at what the near and long-term financial requirements are for each the water and the wastewater utility. And then we're looking at how the cost of service should be recovered by the different types of customers on the classes as residential, commercial, and seeing if there's any potential shifts in cost recovery among your customer classes to improve equity. And then looking at some changes to your rate structure that might simplify it administratively as well as provide some equity with the um, customers that have meters in the ground. Uh, we'll look at both water and wastewater separately. Um, feel free to uh, ask, stop me and ask questions throughout or I'll, I'll just kind of go through the presentation and we can also have questions at the end. So the key issues that we've discovered and challenges for the study and areas that we're looking for consideration, action, direction on is you know, in order to fund the current 
operating program, the capital programs that you have in place in order to fund your infrastructure replacement and maintain reasonable cash operating reserves, the water and sewer rates would need to increase over, over the long, near term and the long term. Uh, the rate structures in place can be simplified to make it more transparent and, and accurate in their cost recovery. And then lastly, the seafood processors have been subsidized by the other customer classes. And the thing that, that that's going to be a big challenge is how to transition them to more equitable cost recovery. But those are kind of the three key areas of the findings that we have and, and what our uh, recommendations are uh, rooted around. First, we'll look at uh, water revenue requirements. That's primarily how much revenue the water utility needs to recover each year uh, over a 10-year period. So if we're looking at your operating expenditures, we uh, evaluated your operating revenues and expenditures for a study period that spanned 2017 through 2024. Uh, we be began the process um, using your 2016 budget as the foundation for forecasting your future revenues and expenditures. And then we forecasted what those would be over the 10-year study period by putting in growth assumptions and kind of cost es escalation factors. Uh, to be conservative, we've assumed that there wouldn't be any actual customer growth in the area over the study period. So without any rate increases, um, the revenues would be uh, remaining about the same level that they are today. Um, the inflationary adjustments that we incorporated are your general costs are expected to increase at about 1.5%, same with your salaries and benefits type costs. And then construction costs generally tend to be a little bit higher, so we forecasted those at 2%. Um, and that's pretty much from the, the current day plan of what your capital project is escalated up to the time that they would actually be implemented, we incorporate that 2% escalation factor. And then finally, we looked at reserve management policies. This is kind of a key area in rate setting to make sure that you have financially sustainable operations, uh, operating reserves. The established policy is to be at 90 days of your annual operating and maintenance expenditures. So that's really setting aside about 25% of your annual operating costs as a reserve. Um, to make sure we can kind of mitigate the rate increases, keep that as feasible as possible, we phased in that policy over the eight years so it wouldn't have an immediate um, impact on, on the rates. And then also to eventually have a capital contingency reserve target that would reach about 2% of your plant in service. That's the assets that you have in the ground. Uh, these are pretty typical um, kind of reserve management policies for utilities that that looks for sustaining um, your infrastructure and making sure that you have day-to-day uh, -day working capital balances. On the capital side, uh, for the water utility, there's about $20.7 million in projects that have been identified in order to maintain the system integrity of the water system, again, looking at a 10-year at a time horizon. Uh, one of the key challenges is going to be that the historical levels of grant funding that you've been able to see for funding a lot of your capital are really no longer reliable. They're significantly reduced or, or eliminated. And so what the challenge will be is to kind of target a defined amount that's going to come from your rates in order to help pay for those capital projects and uh, kind of balance the need to have um, debt to, to occur the capital projects. Uh, so one of the strategies that we have is We've defined an annual contribution from rates that would be transferred to the capital fund, and that's set equal to the utility's annual depreciation expense. So what that means is, you know, all of the assets that you currently have, if you amortize those over their expected useful life, there's a there's a dollar value of that that's kind of the minimum level that's going to be need to be replaced as those assets age. Um, so that's a policy that we've put in place, and again, to kind of mitigate near-term rate increases, we phase that in over the study period. A couple of things to look at, just given given the key importance of um, you know the the reduction in grants over the last few years, we looked at two different scenarios on how you would fund the capital depending on what the grant possibilities might be. Under the baseline analysis, we assumed that you would receive about 30% grant funding and then pay 70% through through local uh, revenue sources. Then we looked at an alternative strategy where the grants have been reduced to about 500 per year, uh, regardless of the individual projects. We just plan for an amount of 500,000 per year. 
Uh, what that's based on is a split between water and wastewater. So I think current understanding is that there may be about a million dollars a year in grant funding available, and that's split between water and wastewater. As, um, so we just kind of targeted that as, as a couple of scenarios. What we don't know is what the actual grant funding will be. There may, there may be less grant funding than we're assuming here, could be more. Uh, basically, the, the real issue is that grant funding is no longer kind of a known entity for getting that infrastructure financed, and it, it is a relatively old system, and so certainly some replacement projects are, are going to be critical. What this chart shows here, uh, so this is the capital financing plan for the 10-year study period. So we got the bars across the bottom, years 2017 to 2024. That shows the annual dollar amount of your total capital program and then what percentage we've had assumed between grants, capital fund balances, and new debt that you're going to fund that. So, for example, you can see that your capital projects are ranging anywhere from, you know, about $2 million five up to as high as, you know, close to $4 million, uh, really averaging somewhere around, you know, $2, $2 million, $2.5 million, and, and how that's going to be funded. So in this first scenario, again, this is the baseline funding scenario, you can see up on that chart to the right, the total capital program is $20.7 million, and of that, under this scenario, we're assuming that about $7 million of that comes from grant funding. Another $10 million comes from the monies you're going to generate from that rate funding mechanism that uh, just kind of reviewed, and then need to issue new debt of about $3.8 million. And so what we're looking for in a rate strategy is you know, how, much, how much funding is going to come from rates to pay for the capital, and then what's a reasonable amount of debt that you can afford through rates and maintain within the industry kind of standards for how much debt a utility should take on. So I can go over a couple examples of that. If we then look at what that means in terms of what your current rates are doing, this solid black line here is, is your current level of rates, so just under $4 million. Uh, the bar charts across left to right show each year what your annual expenditures are. So the bottom bar is your annual operating expenses. So it just kind of goes up a little bit by inflation each year. That next blue bar is your existing debt service. So that is debt that you already have committed and need to pay for through your rates each year. Then the top two bars, this is all about financing your capital improvement program, and that is the balance between how much is going to be new debt and how much is going to be the capital fund contribution. So you can see here, um, you know, any of the bars above that black line means that there's a revenue deficit in order to pay for this capital program. And then, you know, what's the strategy going to be to be able to bring the rates to a level to be able to fund the capital program? Showing you that in a little bit more detail. There's a lots of numbers on this page, so we don't need to worry about looking all of them. I kind of highlighted uh, the piece that I, that I wanted to show, but in general, you're currently getting about $3.9 million in revenues, and then the next section talks about your expenditures, and this area that I have highlighted is these are going to be new expenditures that you currently uh, don't have right now. That's, that's the debt service, that top line there, uh, starting at about 37000 increasing, as you can see, over to the end of the study period up to about 220000 That would be the annual debt service payment that would need to be paid from rates in order to pay for that debt that's incurred to help fund that capital program. The next line below, called Rate Funded System Reinvestment, this is the amount of money that would need to come from rates to generate cash to build the reserves and pay for the annual capital replacement program. So this is really the significant driver of the need to have additional increases, as well as building up to an appropriate operating reserve. Uh, you can see that last line on this chart that's called number of days of cash operating expenditures. Um, the, the target is 90 days, and so we're currently uh, below that, so this is kind of a phased-in strategy to achieve that over time. And essentially, in order to accomplish this scenario, again, assuming that that capital program is going to have you know about a 30% uh, level of uh, grant funding available, the rest coming from rates, you'd need about 5.5% water service rate increases each year of the study period. 
so that's kind of the minimum that's required uh, in order to pay those operating expenditures, pay the debt service that you're currently committed to, and fund that capital program. Sure. See if I'm thinking about this the right way now. Go we'll clear out to 2024, and our revenues are 39 or 3.9 million. And you drop down to where you've got a box of rate funded system reinvestment, and and it's showing. I'm going to say maybe about two million dollars in new rates to cover the deficit. So the deficit, you can see um, that first couple lines down where it says annual surplus de deficit. So in order to incorporate those, you would have like uh, starting out at about a $50,000 a year deficit and then increasing, you can see, up to that about a $1.6 million deficit in that final year. So you're taking all of those revenues. So if we just like went to 2024, your total revenues are 3947 you currently have to, you know, you pay your cash operating expenditures, which is the 3.2 million. You pay the debt, then those two new incremental pieces, which is right at that year end. That's pretty close to two million. Okay, but my, then my question really is: Is that looks to me like a 50 percent increase in rates at that year? 44. Does that mean we'll have to increase our rates by 50 percent in that? They will have had to have been increased by 50 percent over over this study over period. This yeah. So if you look, so right there, we, yeah. So you're looking at that exactly right. Okay. If you look at the annual rate adjustment, it's it's five and a half percent per year. Cumulative, by the time you get to the end, it's going to be that 53.47. So roughly about 50 percent over 10 years averages out to that five and a half percent increase per year. And, and so yeah, and this is under the. Uh, the scenario of the 30% grant funding. And then just to look at the differences, you know, if, if um, this just shows you what the capital fund balances are. We've got operating fund balances at the bottom, then the capital fund balance minimums. And basically, this just shows if we have those 5.5% increases, you're going to build your reserves and be able to pay the capital and, and, and meet those targeted levels of reserves. Um, then the, the other option is, you know, assuming that the grant funding is going to be reduced, which appears to be, you know, fairly likely from from the indications that that we're getting that that um, the grant funding is pretty limited. Uh, this scenario, you can see, drops down. If we look up in that right hand corner box, we still have the same 20.7 million dollar project, but we're only getting about four million dollars from grant funding opposed to, I think it was about $7 million under the other option. So going from 30% grant funding to 19. So that difference has to be made up either through um, new debt service or setting aside more reserves. And so what we've done here is we've increased the debt service. So in that previous scenario, you needed about $3.8 million in new debt to fund the capital. But now with the lower grants, you need a higher amount of debt. And so that, that will result in a, a higher level of rate increases needed. Um, showing you the results of that, again, this is a very similar chart where it just shows that black solid line is where your existing revenues are. And it's just, it's just that balance between those two top bars of debt service and capital contributions that, that causes that deficiency and, and how much rates would need to increase. So in this scenario, same kind of box items, uh, but the debt service goes up higher. So before, where that was, you know, this is a little over two million now by the end of that study period for that 377,808 of new debt service by the end of the study period and the 1.7. So if we have that reduction in available grant funding, that's going to increase the need for rates from that five and a half percent level up to six percent per year. And that brings it from, you know, about that 50% level to closer to 60%. So cumulative by the end of the study period would be 60%. So again, this, these are the two, two differences in, you know, funding the capital needs. And it's really all about how much grant funding is going to be available. And, and if it's not available, how are you going to pay for that aging infrastructure? That's primarily looking at you know, how much revenue does the utility need and a couple of options there. Then um, a little comparison here to look at the 
to look at this kind of side by side between those two scenarios. Again, the 30% grant funding scenario on the left, the reduced grant funding of the 500,000 per year on the right. And then we're looking to make sure that you're staying within reasonable limits of how much debt a utility has. So just summarizing again, you know, grants are 6.9 million under the first scenario versus 4 million, and then that difference is made up for through new debt service. And then the two industry metrics that are important from a financial standpoint is a ratio called your debt to your net fixed assets. That's how much debt do you have compared to you know the value of your assets. Now, currently, um, the water utility is about 22.4% debt to their net assets. That's a pretty good position. Uh, the industry standard is anything less than 35% is considered very strong, and you don't want to be much more than 50% debt, 50% um, cash in, in, in your position. So we're trying to make sure that you stay you know, well within those industry metrics. Um, under both scenarios, it's 22 and 24% respectively, so both well within uh, that limit. Uh, a second industry metric is what's the percentage of your annual debt service compared to your total revenue? And there, the industry standard is you want to be less than 25%. And so here under these scenarios, you're staying within that metric. So those were the things that we were balancing and trying to determine how much of this we would push towards debt versus how much from, from cash funding to make sure that you keep uh, financially uh, sustainable. And then just comparing again uh, the annual increases and the cumulative between the two scenarios. So this is kind of the first part of the study is looking at first just how much revenue do you need, what are the level of uh, increases to your service rates are needed in order to pay your operating and to pay your capital expenditures. Then the next part of the study is looking at how would those costs then be recovered from the different customers on your water system, your residential versus your commercial, and how we might look at that, that in terms of different rate structures. So what we do is, uh, and this is just kind of a snapshot of the summary, we look at all the functions of your water system. So basically those um, the bars across the top, the water system, it provides customer-related services, it provides services related to the service lines and meters that you have in place. Uh, base, demand, base demand is being able to deliver that average annual um, demand for your customers. Peak demand is the increased level of demand that's required during your seasonal periods, fire protection services. So that's basically the categories of the functions of a water system. And then we look at your total system costs and we allocate them to those functions based on you know, engineering design criteria. Um, so without going into all the details of how that's done, the summary of that is of your total water system costs, about 3% are related to customer services and 55% related to base demand, 28% related to peak demand, just for an example. Then we take that information and we look at how should we allocate those costs down to your customers, the different types of customers on your system? Uh, currently, you have small, I mean, single family residential, multifamily residential, small commercial, large commercial, seized food processors, and the private fire hydrants. Um, the small commercial customers also include, so it's really probably more accurate to say unmetered customers versus metered customers. The small the small commercial customers are, don't have meters in the ground, the large commercial um, do. Uh, but the interesting thing that when you look at something like this, when you go through this detailed allocation is single family residential under that customer category, they're 84% of your customers. So they're going to get 84% of your customer related costs. But seafood processors, for example, they're, they're out to the decimal, so they're like a point you know, 0 0.01, so they're very small in terms of your customer, but they're 50% of your, your water usage on your system, and they're 71% of your peak demand, so they're a huge user in terms of, so while they're small in number, they're huge in the demand on your system. They're the largest demand placed on your system of all your, of all your other customers. And so this is kind of a key in, in then, you know, how you would allocate those costs, pretty much you everyone should pay according to how they use the system. That's kind of the, the definition of, of equitable cost recovery. 
Um, so just to just kind of give an idea, if you look over to the far right, what this means in total of, of your total water system costs, single families should pay about 35% of them. Um, Multifamily about four percent, seafood process for forty-eight percent, and so on. So again, really, they they should be paying about half of your system cost just on how much significant demand they have on your system. And then we compare that to you know how you're currently recovering, and look at, and look and see what kind of adjustments should should be uh, evaluated. So these are the results of our analysis where we went through, and this first column. Uh, that's just what the total utility with that five and a half percent increase that's needed needs three million eight hundred sixty two thousand eight hundred and eleven dollars and here's how the cost of service analysis lays out that that should be recovered so for example since single families should pay one point four million of that large commercial should pay one hundred and four thousand seafood processors should pay one point nine million of that then you go over to the prevailing rates column, those are your existing cost recovery, and you can see that single family residential is paying about 1.7 million, and seafood processors are paying $168,000. So a significant imbalance currently in how the recovery is coming from the customer classes. Uh, and the key becomes, you know, how, you know, how, do, you, you know, how do you process that and, and, and evaluate and, and approach to right size the revenue distribution between the customer classes. Um, this pure cost of service outcome, again, it aligns it with, with the demands on the system. It would obviously call for rate levels that would be extreme um, shift burdens between customer classes. And generally, you know, this would not be something that would be something palatable to be done in a one-shot deal. It would be a pretty, pretty significant change. Um, so what we're looking for is strategies on how you might move to that move to that type of a, an equitable outcome over time. So this is just showing you based on how it how it should be from the demands on the system to what some strategies might be to move closer to that. Giving it just a little bit, so the focus here is clearly on, you know, how, how we transition um, cost recovery uh, between other customers and seafood processors. Uh, just giving a little bit more information uh, the current seafood processor rates and demographics, um, there's a fixed rate of about 1930 per month for three inches and larger. Uh, based on the current data set that we were looking at, you have about two four-inch lines, three six-inch lines, and one eight-inch lines for those customers. And their annual demand is about 355 thousand units that's and that's in thousands of gallons and they are metered so we do have that information from from the monthly uh, meter rates for those customers uh, looking at 2017 if you took the current rate revenue that you're receiving from them if you remember that was about one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars and you divide it by their units you're saying they're paying about 47 cents per thousand gallons if you were to kind of turn that into a to a comparable unit cost, You're paying 47 cents uh, for their service, compared to the cost of service result, which says they should be paying five dollars and 23 cents. So you can see, you know, the significant uh, material difference there. Then, if you look at your water system in total, at your water production, the total revenues of the utility uh, compared to the total water produced by the utility. The unit cost for the system as a whole is two dollars and seventy-seven cents. You know, so that's the average cost, and so you kind of just just kind of illustrate that. Um, you know, there has been historical, probably economic development rationale, and, and you know all kinds of all kinds of reasons of um, why it's where it's at. But that's just to give you kind of a true picture of of what it looks like between where they are what it looks like they should be and kind of comparing that to, at a minimum, the, the total system cost of the whole utility. Then looking at, you know, how we're proposing maybe to make some changes to your rate structures that might help some of this. Um, the first column is just again listing all of your customer classes. Then this middle section, we look at what your current rates are. So right now your single family residential pays about $52 per home. There's a, a discount for the seniors. 
we're not recommending any changes to that rate structure. They're going to stay flat rate, so it will be a fixed rate per home. Uh, the only change would be the level of the rate, uh, depending on which scenario is chosen. Uh, multifamily currently pays a, a rate that um, ranges from 4069 to 5205 per connection, depending on the number of dwelling units. So as the number of dwelling units increase, the unit cost decreases. And so we're recommending a change to that where you basically just have one uniform fixed rate per dwelling unit. And it doesn't vary by how many dwelling units you have. Um, that's a simplification and more in line with um, industry practice. Um, small commercial is kind of the key area where there's a, a fairly complex flat rate system charge basis. So they're, they're, they're all unmetered, so there isn't meter data to, to base a meter charge on. Uh, there's three components to their rate. There's a base rate of 5426, and then there's a charge that varies by their service line, ranging from 36 cents on up, depending on the size of the service line, plus additional charges for a variety of different demographics. Are they a restaurant? Are they a bar? How many seats do they have? Students? You know, it's fa you know fairly complex, uh, administrative, challenging uh, structure. Um, but absent having metered data, it's, you know, what's an appropriate structure to charge these from, but make it a little bit more administratively easy to understand it and also to consistently apply. It can be very challenging to consistently apply this type of a, type of a structure. Uh, for example, you know, you don't always know how many chairs that, you know, the restaurant has or, you know, things can change. So um, our, our proposal here is that you really simplify that and have a fixed rate that increases by the service line size. So a smaller service line size indicates that you have a lower demand on the system. A higher service line size would indicate that you have a larger demand on the system. So that's a, a more equitable process where we can at least try to estimate the difference between how much you should pay rather than you know how many stools you have or how many seats or, or, or things. So, so that's kind of the proposal for two things, simplifying it and maybe making it a little bit more proportional to the size of the customer as opposed to the, the type of the individual business. How does that work for fire sprinkler systems? You may only need a three-quarter inch line for what you're doing, but mm -hmm. then you require the sprinkler so you have a three and a half or four inch line coming into the building. So there's, I mean, there's different options on how you can address something like that. Um, clearly, let me, if you don't mind, if, if I can yeah. go through these three and then I can, I can address that question for both the small and the large commercial. Okay. Um, so large commercial, then they have um, $108 and then it increases by service line size. Uh, what we're proposing here, the large commercial that we have in this, in this category are all metered. Um, we've got meter reads for everyone. The water usage is available, so we're proposing that you actually charge them based on their actual water consumption. Um, they would have two components to the rate. It would be a fixed rate increasing by their meter size plus a rate per unit of meter consumption. This would help improve any of the inequities within that class where, you know, whatever water usage you use, you're going to pay for that usage. So if you use more water, you're going to pay more. If you use less water, you'll pay less water. And then your service line size is based on the size of your connection, which implies the, the amount of demand you can place on the system. Seafood processors, same thing as large commercial in that um, they are metered, and there's, there's monthly meter reading data for those customers. And so proposing that we actually charge them a, a metered rate based on their actual consumption. Uh, again, this, this would significantly improve the equity between the different types of seafood processors. One seafood processor may use a lot more water than another one. And this way, you know, just charging them all the same rate, this would improve, you know, that type of an equity. And then start giving, you know, everyone a clear a clear idea of really the amount of water that each seafood processor is, is using and then charging them for that. Private fire hydrant, again, this uh, currently the charge uh, ranges from $90 to about $215. Again, that's based on size. Um, discussion with, um, with city staff was that they're pretty much all the same size, so let's just make it a uniform rate per connection. So that's a relatively small change there. Um, now to you know, try to address some of your questions there on the 
on the sprinkler stuff. It's, it's there's not an easy answer, <laughs> certainly. Um, on the lar if they're metered, it's a, uh, it can be a little bit easier. So we got two. There's two questions I'm going to try to answer. One is when you have people who have seasonal use and they and they want their meter for fire protection during the non-seasonal. So you have you know a business that needs a three-inch line during their business operations, but then uh, when it's not out of season, they don't they don't need that other than for fire. A metered rate structure takes care of that. Um, they're they're just paying for their um, fixed charge, and then when they're not using the water or they're using much less water, their their bill goes way down. So, so that that can be accommodated when you go to meter. With a small commercial, well, it's still based on a fixed rate, it's really challenging um, to be able to to do that. So, a couple of options is you can you know you can try to split out the charge and say, okay, you you got a fixed rate. I mean, I'd have to think of some some really good examples of what of what wouldn't overly be a billingly administrative for that. Generally speaking, they just pay the if it's a flat rate, they just pay the charge. Yeah, so across the street here, you have a lot that has a uh, meeting one day a week, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't have any exorbitant water use, yeah. and yet they're charged by the line size, yes. and it's very inequitable. Yeah, and that's that's the issue. There is no there is no way to have equitable rates on a flat rate system. So you could meter that. Yeah, it, um, and, I'm, and I'm not sure what the challenges would be from, you know, what the ground situation is for all the small courses, but, but metering solves all those inequities. Uh, with ab absent metering, you, there's always going to be some kind of inequities, just, you know, you know, who gets it, so it's really trying to balance it. So um, if we metered small commercial in addition to the large commercial, that would, that would resolve that question. Um, similar types of questions that come up with with this kind of thing is, okay, so someone, there used to be a business with a four-inch line in there. Someone else now comes and moves in and they only need two inches. Um, they don't want to pay the four-inch, you know, because they only need a two-inch. Um, there's Pretty much there's a hardline policy on that one is if there's a change in service, it's on the customer side that they dig up their meter and replace it with a smaller meter. So I don't know if those questions have come up as well either, but we, you know, we hear that one um, now and again too. So um, always, always little challenges on kind of these one-offs. Um, it's kind of that fine line between making sure that you're not making a lot of exceptions, but you're finding a policy that can that can be as fairly implemented across the customer base without, you know, administratively having a bunch of side <laughs> side side deals for, for, for people on if they don't need the meter size. But overall, if someone doesn't want to pay a three inch line because they don't need it, it would be at their cost to go change it to the line that they would need and then they pay the lower rate. Not always really positive you, you know, um, the favorite answer that um, that is like but it's but it's pretty much kind of a practice. So that's kind of it. Any other questions on the rate design? I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Now, in that last column out there, take a single family resident. Are you just, you're not proposing any change? Is that what I think? I'm not proposing any change to the actual structure. It's still going to be a fixed rate for home. The dollar amount of it would change. Yeah, because right now that rate is, as I rather doubt the average family, because I've been on a meter and I've been on its tank. It's probably between three and four thousand gallons a month. And you you do the math. That's twelve to sixteen dollars per thousand is what I'm paying for my water. And that's one heck of a lot more than what it's cost. So I mean that's where we're that's where the residential people are subsidizing the rest of the system. Yeah. Those and so paying. yeah. And so that goes to, you know, kind of what what the policy choices here here are, but you're basically answering that question of, uh, you know, it did show that the single family were overpaying their share, seafood processors were underpaying their share. So if we were to fix everything in that perfect world and go to pure cost of service, everyone would have a big decrease in seafood, would have a, a big increase. 
Yeah, and so it's really the balancing of that. You know, it, it's it's never very palatable to to make these fixes overnight. It's how fast, how long, <laughs> you know, to to kind of get to get them right sized. Even over seven years, a thousand percent is pretty big. Though. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty big number. Well, how, and, and just out of curiosity, how, how would you then account for the fact that in all likelihood, if if we did increase a huge amount, we still look, we need, need to generate a certain amount of revenue for this old work. What if they cut that? Then everyone else's increase would ha would right. have to increase. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a, it's all that balance, and that's kind of one of the proposals that we'll, that we'll get here too. Is when you move to charging someone on a metered rate, you really don't know what their behavior change is going to be. So it's good to have a little bit of a safeguard and watch and watch that closely because the bottom line is you need three point eight million dollars in revenue, and and if someone uses less water because you jacked up their bill then everyone has to pay for that. So that's why it's always, you know, it's it's never prudent to make a drastic fix like this all, all, all at once. So this was primarily just for the information to kind of show what, you know, what that end game really would look like. Um, so looking at a couple of options. So we looked at three options. One is that pure cost of service outcome where we implement that redesign rate structure. It generates the overall revenue in line with the baseline scenario where, we, where you're getting 5.5% more money per year. It recovers the revenue from the classes exactly as the cost of service indicates it would, and so it implements those changes to the cost, cost burden shifts described previously. So that's up here as an option. It's not up here as a recommended option, but it's up here as an option for consideration. Um, the second option is... Um, Let's say that the most important thing is that the utility needs to get five and a half percent more increases because it becomes critical to to pay for the, that aging infrastructure. We're going to redesign the rate structure because that you know that does a lot of improvements, um, but just recover the, the revenue from the classes in the same distribution as that you are currently doing. So what it does is it basically increases everyone by five and a half percent, but it doesn't fix the subsidy. It continues the current customer class subsidy. So this is another option. This is almost status quo in your cost recovery from classes, but getting getting the rate increases that you needed to, to generate the revenue. Our recommended strategy is a phased approach, which is kind of a combination. So implement the rate outcome for outcome two for all classes except the seafood processors. So single family, multifamily, small commercial, large commercial, increase them with a system wide need of five and a half percent and then begin an eight year phase in of moving those seafood processors towards that pure cost of service. And so what the key what the key here is, you know, how big of a how big of a annual increment of an increase um, are you comfortable with for that class and then what that means in terms of what you can do for the other classes. Um, so this is a recommendation to you know, at least start that process of moving the seafood processors towards that cost of service. Uh, what that will look like in the terms of the rate, it's a little bit hard to see, so I'm just really going to focus on that line that says seafood processors, that second to the last column. Under the redesigned rate structure, they're going to have a fixed charge that increases by the size of their meter, so starting at about, you know, 1601 if they're a small one, but the gears are more in the in the three inch line, so um, they have a fixed charge that they would pay every month, um, and then they would pay five dollars and sixteen cents for all of their water usage. Um, you compare that then to large commercial, you can see if they switch to a metered rate, they'd have a fixed charge and they'd pay five twenty nine. Your single family, if you remember that rate that you were referring to, um, was fifty two dollars per month. That would decrease to forty two twenty seven. Again, this is if you immediately went to that pure cost of service example. Again, I'm just showing this mostly for illustrative purposes. Um, and what's happening here then is you would be generating that revenue, but you can see over next to that seafood processor, that top blue line, you'd be getting $1.9 million from the versus what you're currently getting of $168,000. So, I mean, that's just, that's, that's a pretty significant, pretty significant shift. Um, and then, you know, all the other classes would, um, would reduce accordingly. That's option one. 
Option two is really just taking all of the customer classes and increasing them by five and a half percent. So and 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 fixing the rate structure. So you would have two positives accomplished with this with this option is that you would get the five and a half percent annual revenue that you need, and you would have that redesigned rate structure which charges those customers on their meter usage and really simplifies that small commercial three component rate structure. Um, the, so the, you know, the disadvantage of this one is you aren't getting any movement towards uh, improving that equity between seafood processors and the other customers. Uh, and again, that drops the rate from the you know, 523 or so that they should be paying down to about 49 cents um, under, under this option. So that means the processors aren't paying anything but what they are now. They're paying. They would just be paying five and a half percent more. So, so in total, everyone is just paying five and a half percent more. We've just changed the structure. So, what this one would accomplish is within that class. Let's say there's a seafood processor who uses a whole lot of water, and there's a seafood processor that doesn't use very much. It would correct that imbalance. But in total, they would still only. See, you can see they're currently only getting 168 thousand from them. We would only be getting 177, so not much improvement towards that million eight. Uh, but again, this is you know I, I try to give you know options that that um, might meet a variety of needs, and so this does accomplish I would say you know two of the three goals: is it gets you your revenue and it simplifies your rate structure. Um, so the the third option, uh, which would be um, the recommended approach is really we focus the immediate change on the structural redesign of rates. You know, as we talked about on the on the prior slides, I believe that has a lot of advantages from administration to improving equity within the classes and just simplifying the process. And then begin implementation towards cost of service rate levels for seafood processors. Again, as I mentioned, like you know, set an eight-year phase-in schedule. And then my recommendation is, you know, in these initial years of doing this phase-in. You know, don't rely on that increased revenue from seafood processors to make cost of service changes in the other classes. Kind of use that as what we had just talked about in that safeguard of your revenue stability when, you, when you're moving to a metered rate structure. You really don't know the behavior of a processor. So, um, you know, the schedule would be just, you know, increase everyone else at the 5.5% or the 6% if you're choosing scenario number two for revenue requirements and then just move the seafood processors. Um, in eight steps, basically, to get to where they need to be. Um, if, the, if that was the selection um, that you wanted to go with, we would provide the full schedule of rates for each year of the study period that would show exactly how that seafood processor rate would phase in. Um, and then we would expect that, you know, that would be revisited in future years to, to then kind of recalibrate the rates for the other classes as that subsidy is eventually eliminated and kind of have a feel for uh, what the water usage patterns of your customers are um, under the new metered rate structure. Um, looking at that, how that looks, that changed there. So uh, under the seafood processor, it was um, 49 cents if we just increased them by the 5.5%. What I'm suggesting here is in this first increment that we basically double, we basically double where they are. So you're currently getting about 168,000 that you double it to, you know, 350, um, and then kind of kind of phase 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 through it over time, you know, bumping that up to about 97 cents. Um, so doubling it the first year and then doubling year. every or just the first year. You, it's kind of a big jump in the first year, and then it okay. would go down. So probably like a doubling, so 50, then 40, 30, 20. To, mm -hmm. You know, it would, it would gradually go gradually go down, but to it make any impact, increases. yeah, it yeah. Be less of an increase, less of an increase, exactly, because it because you know to get to that thousand percent, <laughs> yes. yes. uh, basically is to get you know another million four or something, you know, revenue. But this is but this would be a start, and it's and it's pretty hard to do a whole lot more in one year than double someone's, you know. But from a dollar standpoint, you know, saying that you're doubling someone's bill uh, sounds. Um, sounds like a lot, but when you look at it, you know, residents are paying, you know, 1.8 million and um, the seafood processor is 350. So this would be our recommended approach to be moving towards that. And again, you'd be getting the rate increases that you need in order to fund that capital 
and 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 moving moving towards it in a in a, in a fashion that's not overly burdensome on the customers, as opposed to what you know immediately going to that full cost of service would do. So I think that's the recommendation there. So before. Um, so, so same kind of analysis done on uh, wastewater. Any questions on the water part before I kind of go through the same same type of analysis we did for wastewater? Yeah, I, I do have a question. You go back to where we're looking at the residential rates, and I guess I'm hung up on it. That the fifty and fifty-five dollars per per household. Who comes up with the fact that it's that high? Well, that's that is your current rate right now. That's just oh, what it okay. is. That doesn't mean that's what it costs. That just means that's what. That's it what it is. Stuff. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Quick, quick question. Um, did okay. you now? Obviously, you're basing you're basing the, the, the need, projected need on first of all whether we get thirty percent reimbursement you know, funding from the state or right. we get or we get a flat one million or five hundred thousand. What if we get zero? Right. If you we, get zero, you need to complete. If you get zero, you need to you need to revamp your capital improvement program right. because it's going to be as. So we're looking at seven percent, eight percent, nine percent. In in water, um, I mean, I'd have to run in. We didn't run zero because okay. you know if you're down to zero, I think it's a reevaluation of your capital program prioritization yeah. probably. Okay. Sewer it, wastewater is much worse. I mean, there's a significantly larger. Wastewater CIP. So the non, the no grant issue is far more critical there. Yeah. It, just to kind of clarify one thing for me, the five percent increase only covers capital. No, it covers the five and a half percent increase covers uh, covers everything. So let capital me capital and increased employee costs, but they're going to go up probably five percent a year anyway. So this slide right, let's just get to the side. So this slide right here, this is 6%, so this is the one scenario. If we just kind of flip back to that scenario we were talking about. So if at 5.5% increase, you fully fund your capital program. That's these line items that say new debt service and rate-funded system reinvestment. That's the box numbers. Plus it funds the things you already have in place, which is your, cap, your annual operating expenditures, and your debt service. So it fully funds your utility obligations, operations, and capital. Okay. And we builds can, reserves. And builds mm -hmm. reserves, yeah. So so it fully funds kind of what our recommended approach is for making sure that you're meeting your operating, uh, you're replacing the aging infrastructure, and you have appropriate reserves to make sure that you stay in a financially solid position. And, and one of the key kind of important factors in making sure you do have, you know, appropriate reserves and and make sure you stay within those industry kind of uh, key performance metrics for debt services. When you do have to go out for a new debt, you need to look financially able to repay the debt. And those are the kinds of things that they look at uh, when they're evaluating um, the feasibility of someone being able to repay debt. So yes, if that answers your question. This 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 strategy will fully fund all all of the costs that have currently been identified um, and forecast. Can I ask the question? I think we're seeing in our budget here that this actually our labor and benefits to the labor is costing us three to five percent a year. But that's included in there, right? It's included. Yeah, yeah, it's included in your cash operating. That that two point eight million dollars. So again, based on you know, kind of based on the discussions that we had internally, you know, the assumption was that everything would go up by about one and a half percent overall. Now there may be. You know, some things that are higher, some things that are lower. So we're just sort of trying to say, you know, on average, your your total operating budget is going to go up by about one and a half percent. And again, it may go up higher, it may go up lower. You know, that's that's you know, those are kind of kind of best best estimates. Without, you know, we don't want to really overestimate um, or understand. You try to get that that fine balance. And again, um, even though this plan is put together for ten years. It would certainly be something that would be looked at um, annually to make sure that nothing has gone, you know, way out of line. Um, if something changed materially. Okay. Shall we move on to wastewater or any other Not questions? Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry about that. laughs> Let's move on to wastewater. <laughs> Did you have something? No, no, no. no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, wastewater. Same type of information, so this is all the same. Um, same assumptions for, for operating days of reserves. Um, on the capital, as I mentioned, significantly more projects identified for wastewater, about $44 million in project ad identified. And again, so, you know, the loss of ground there is, is even, you know, kind of exponential problem um, compared to water. Again, we're, we're targeting that defined annual contribution from rates um, to transfer to the capital fund to help pay for those expenditures. And then again, we've looked at a couple of uh, sensitivity analysis, the baseline 7030 and the same uh, reduced grant of 500 per year. Um, one of the things that, that I did overlay in this scenario of the 500,000 is if, if you did only get the 500,000, it requires delaying near-term projects to avoid immediate rate spikes. If I just looked at it, if you just had 500 a year, you'd need a really big increase right away. So I thought, well, you know, at a minimum, maybe we could take one of these large projects and shift it out a year. So, um, you know, just something like that to, 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 mitigate, to mitigate it. Uh, either way, you know, wastewater is, is pretty challenging, uh, absent the grants. Um, so looking at that, we'll just focus on um, this right-hand column. You can kind of see, again, the bars across show what the annual program is, you can see there's some large expenditures in 2020. Um, that is the year that when I did the alternative analysis of 500, I took a couple of those projects and just bumped them out a couple of years just to smooth that 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 big thing. Um, again, I did not look at that from an engineering or water system reliability standpoint, um, so that was something that would have to be evaluated, but, but just looking at that. So so my 70-30 scenario for water in, in, in all actually actually came out to be about 40% um, grant funding because there was a couple of projects um, in the information that we had that were fully grant funded. So it's a little bit more than, than 30%. Um, but overall, so about $19 million in grant funding, uh, about $7 million in the capital fund, and then new debt is $18 million. So that's new debt issuance. So, uh, to, fund, to fund this project um, again, and this is at our, our low grant scenario. So you can see the changing things here uh, to kind of remember 18.9 million for grants, capital fund balance, and then the total. Um, what that means again here, very similar to water in that your current rates are covering your obligations for your operating and maintenance expense and your existing debt. Uh, it just it's just not sufficient enough to um, pay for that aging infrastructure. So again, it's that balance between how much is debt and how much is contributed from rates to the capital fund, fund to pay for that here. Um, again, looking at this, same type of an idea. I've highlighted that the new debt service is going to eventually end up at about 841000 per year. Um, so here, uh, what it's needed to fully fund your operations, fully fund that capital program, assuming that you get that um, 40% grant funding, you would need 6% increases to meet all of that and maintain your um, appropriate operating reserves. Uh, so again, um, pretty big increase to, uh, I mean, pretty big portion of this is relying on grant funding. Um, so we see even in the second scenario, it's a little bit more challenging, uh, but this 6% would, uh, would, would fund things if you were able to, you know, to still get some grant funding. This just shows that you'd be meeting the reserves we're proposing. Um, so here's the one where we look at, if we reduce it down to 500,000 per year, you can see, if, if you recall, that grant funding contribution section was 18 million before. You get 500,000 a year, it doesn't even put a dent in a $44 million project. So that capital fund balance needs to significantly go up, um, which means rates need to go up in order to fund that. And then if you remember that spike in 2020 where the capital projects uh, were higher, I just bumped that out a few years just to give an opportunity to help build the reserves just to see, you know, how feasible we could make the rate structure, um, rate increase structure be if you, if you got the reduced level of funding. So under this scenario here, again, you need a, a significantly larger amount of cash contributions, which is that big blue bars. And what you would need here, to the best that I could smooth this out, uh, is 16% increases for the majority of the study period, and then a couple of inflationary. So, uh, again, grant funding critical on the wastewater side. 
bringing it basically from 6% to about 160% cumulative. <clears throat> so again, um, most significantly, this is the increase to directly funding the capital projects and making sure that the debt financing doesn't exceed the industry accepted standards. So I didn't want to increase the debt too much because then um, you run into you know not meeting the industry. Is that uh, still around 13 percent that you got on the other on, on the water one, or is it, is it, is it different? Let's that? just flip to that right here. So the comparison, yeah, you know, trying to keep that relatively the same, you know, rounding differences and stuff, and trying to do the smoother reading, but we're trying to keep that about the same. Um, you can see right now your debt to net fixed assets it, under both scenarios, it's around you know 33, 34 percent. Again, we want to stay less than 40. We play with that probably a little bit, but I tried to maintain that. Um, you know, currently you're at 17, so we basically doubled it, and so I didn't feel like it was appropriate to go much more than that. Um, again, your um, debt service, your annual debt to service revenue needs to be less than 25%. You're doing okay there, but basically it's the difference between, you know, 6% a year and 16% a year um, is a 60% overall increase versus, you know, more than a doubling of that. Mm -hmm. So just kind of showing what that potential impact of that is. Cost of service, we have a lot of the same issues. Um, in, in uh, not same issues, going through the same approach. Uh, but for the wastewater system, we're looking at customers, we're looking at flow, that's the contributed sewer, we're looking at strength of the sewer, um, which comes in, you know, BOD, suspended solids, that's just the different types of strength concentrations into a system. We do the same process, we allocate all your costs to those functions, and then we look at each customer class and see, you know, what their share of that is. And where this really differs for seafood processors between water, if you remember, like single family was like 85-ish, 84% of your total <coughs> customer base, but less than 50% of, and, and of the, the demand and seafood processors was were a high high part of the flow where in high part of the demand and the seasonal demand different in in the sewer contribution because they're all of their all of their water use does not go into the sewer system so very different very different patterns um, for their for their wastewater demand than, than, than their water so it doesn't seem as pronounced of an, of a, of an issue um, here. Uh, but again, just kind of we went through that that detailed analysis. We don't have enough detail on the on the current data that we have to break out um, the cost of service differences. Your current system looks at uh, your revenues in total for all of residential and all of non-residential. So what we can tell from the analysis is that um, in this case, your non-residential are subsidizing your residential on the wastewater side. And again, this is by looking at pure cost of service. If we, again, we're looking at this at a combined basis where we're saying residential versus non-residential, um, it would be that cost burden. What I would suspect if, if there was additional detail accumulated is within that non-residential, there's probably some significant imbalances in there um, where seafood processor or large commercial or someone may be subsidizing within that class. Uh, just uh, the details not available to look at that at this point. So we didn't go as far into detail on the, on the wastewater side as we did on water, thinking that probably the, the challenges on water <laughs> and the rate increases on, on wastewater would be um, challenges in off. Um, so looking at the rates, um, again, so these are what you're currently paying, what your customers are currently paying. Uh, everyone pays the forty-nine ninety-eight per equivalent residential unit, and that's defined very differently um, between the, the small commercial. Uh, again, so some couple changes recommended for redesigning the rate structure, very similar to water. We would maintain the same fixed rate per home structure for single family, a fixed rate per dwelling unit for multifamily, and then small commercial. In a, a we would change to a fixed rate that increases by the service line size. Um, for a large commercial, it would be a fixed rate increasing by meter size plus a rate of per unit of metered water consumption applied to an estimated return factor. So since we do have metered water usage for them, it is possible to you know, charge them a metered rate for wastewater as well, recognizing that a lot of these customers don't 
all of their water doesn't return to the sewer. So we apply factors to it that would say, well, only, you know, only 95% of the water returns to sewer, or only 5% or so on. So there's a, there's a, a recognition in there that, that not all of the water goes in the video, but it's still be basically the emitter grade structure. And then again, same for seafood processors is that, um, you know, currently the seafood processor is charged that business rate of the 40, 4998, but looking at actually, you know, the seafood processing side of it, um, they would have a meter grade structure, and again, very little of their flow, only about 5% is estimated to um, go back into the wastewater system. Um, if you just kind of looked at that, at the peer cost of service outcome, it would show that the residential customers' rates would increase, and then it would change the structure for, um, you know, small commercial would stay um, 96.18 per service line, and then that would increase as the size of the meter increases. I just didn't lay it all out by size. Um, and then large commercial, again, would have a fixed charge and a volume charge. So here is $10.73 per thousand gallons, and that would be applied only to water usage that's estimated to go into the sewer system and same for seafood processors. It would go to a metered rate structure. Um, so this is kind of where we where we left this one at, um, is you know, you know, look, looking at changing that, that rate structure here. So that really leads me to just kind of discussion action items or any, any additional questions that you might have, just kind of a, a reiteration of you know, rates, rates really needing to increase all about that capital infrastructure replacement and reserves, simplifying the structure and really you know, making an estimation and determination of how, how quickly and how significantly we move seafood processors towards, towards the, the goal of cost of service. Answer any other questions or comments? Or? You can hit the button there and then you can talk in the light. Unless you have more to go. No. no. I just can't see with that thing shining. I need to see how to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you have to go. There we go. No. So, oh, so we can have a copy of your PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, email it to you. Yeah, yeah, so Bob has a copy yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. That was the first question. Make sure you have it. Yeah, yeah. Email it to the clerk and she can give us all the copies. You know, and I have to read that. It was a great presentation. It doesn't change, though. It um, still makes it more <laughs> understandable every time I redo one of these. And I understand on the um, water side, you know, we're aiming towards, and, you know, we talked to the processors, and I think we gave them a three year. Um, time limit before we started kicking into um, metered because uh, some of them still wanted to or at least uh, one of them wanted to really work on you know saving water because they weren't really set up for it so we gave them a three year um, time to do that which I think the th third year is up it's, okay. and um, so I understand that part real good where we want to get into um, you know, having the base and then start meeting their water so they're paying more of what because they use the most on the um, wastewater side there, I went quick at the end there, um, and I think I read on there, um, we want to meter like um, processors and large commercial um, at, was that 95% for large and 5% for? It's different for a couple of individual ones where we've, but we've gone through, but it would be, it would be a metered rate and it would be applied to that usage plus a return factor for seafood processors, it, it, was, it was about 5%. And I'd have to go back and look at the detail. I think it ranged, but it, it was predominantly, I think there were some large that had 10% in there, um, depending on the depending on the individual customer it varied. But the seafood processors was was 5%. Okay. And that was really just assuming, you know, most of the processes don't go in there. Okay. So... Uh, if we metered, I mean, if we did both things for the seafood processors, I guess this might be a question for Bob, what kind of rate are we looking to increase for both? I mean, what kind of projections are we looking for the total for seafood processors for the new year? If we did, if we went ahead and agreed to this. I can't tell you what the percentage is, but right now, uh, the weight of the Seafood processors are paying about 168000 
of the water, and I think the proposal was to double the for um, the water grade, so they bring in about 320000 and then right now they're not paying anything for our wastewater. I think the wastewater charge is about 177000 so Is that what they're paying right now? They're not paying anything right now for wastewater mm -hmm. on the county side. And so if we implemented something, they'd be paying how much? 177000 plus 328 for water and sewer. And right now they're only paying 168000 We're basically triple. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm slow, so go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> okay, if we did raise it 6%, <laughs> we're talking about? Okay, so right now they're... I'm talking wastewater. On wastewater. Right now they're not paying anything. Yes, so if we They'll implemented... They'll be paying 177000 Between the three of them? Right. Okay, and that's at what rate? Um, set rate? The $9.70 is the volume rate, and then uh, the service line uh, changes depending so on the size. So they'd pay a volume rate? And, and then uh, uh, pipe size? Yeah, yeah, service line size, yeah, meter size, yeah. Okay, and so, um, and then where does the 5% um, thing come in? That's what the $9.70 would, would be applied to. Okay, thank their you. Their total water use, 95% of their, uh, yeah, 5% of their total water usage okay. would be applied that 970. Yeah, because, um, you, know, you know, we have real good water rates and stuff um, for the seafood and they've you know, invested greatly in this community and mm -hmm. I think um, you know as we can see and we've talked about it for years is the residentials carrying the load mm -hmm. and um, they need um, I think it's this is the year we need to talk about making these changes for start making the changes with the seafood processors and our commercials so um, thank you that um, made it more clear to me are, are Bob, you bet are, are the seafood processors paying any Rates for the bunkhouses? Yes, they are. The bunkhouses are paying. Yeah. 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 You bet, Bob. One of the classes I didn't see under was an industrial rate. So that's uh, there would be a combination in the in the large large, large commercial. So probably a, a, a better name, and I'll change this going forward if this makes sense. The small commercial and the large commercial. I would probably suggest we change that to unmetered commercial and metered commercial. That way, it, uh, commercial and industrial would fall into that category as well. Any other questions? I just have one. Please. Were the schools included in that? That would be large. Commercial, that would be right? large commercial. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? I appreciate your time and effort, sure. and uh, make sure you get those sent to us. We'll do. So we'll and um, it gives us, um, you know, we've been looking, or at least I've been looking for, you know, more and more answers on how do we do it. It just helps me in the direction of how. So yeah, thank you very much. You should have come back to the meeting when the, when the processes are all here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to need all the backup we can because they, they come in, they scream, and we go, oh, fine, whatever. And, and we, we Let's take a five minute break. Thank you. Okay, that was depressing. So where did that take off? Did. 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 Just choose the microphone back on. Oh, please. We don't really want to do that. You don't need to hear me. All right, let's get back into the um, thing. We had the presentation. I think um, at least um, I'll bring up something on uh, doing something on the water, the wastewater here when we get into KPU. But let's try to get through some more up on um, the city as much as we can tonight. I believe we're at um, information technologies is where we left off. Oh, yeah, we're going to do updates. The ones that need motions. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I move the city council to adopt the policy of allocating raw fish tax payment to the Harbor Construction Fund and the KPU Enterprise Fund. The plan is based on uh, would require 77 percent to be uh, of the proceeds to be accounted for in the Harbor Construction Fund and 23 percent of the proceeds to be accounted for in the KPU Enterprise Fund, effective for the budget year beginning January 1st, 2016. Yeah. Second. Bob. Carl, does this change anything? This is one alternative that we put together based on council's request that we go through the allocation of the raw fish tax um, more emphasis.
emphasis on it going to the harbors as opposed to KPU. Um, basically, Bob took an average of what's been done over the last couple of years in terms of allocating between the Harbor Construction Fund and the KPU Enterprise Fund. Uh, you can go from keeping it from a, the status quo, what we do now, to zeroing out uh, money going to KPU. We came up with a allocation of 77% to the Harbor Construction Fund and 23% to the KPU Enterprise Fund. That's what the motion affects. I guess I'm wondering what the, I'm, I haven't read this yet, so I was just wondering what the difference was in percentage. Before with the flat rate. Yeah, hundred yeah, thousand would just go into the, okay, so under this um, setup, how much is, what are we looking at going Second into Second paragraph, bottom line. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. Ready, call roll? Mm -hmm. Call roll. Isa? Yes. Gage? Yes. Kuz? Here. Laura? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Piper? Yes. Okay, that passes seven to nothing, Bob. The way for one doesn't have Not all of them really much. Number eight is the next one. Number eight. Okay, I got number eight right here. That's a question there. If I could just elaborate on that, number eight addresses the issue that was brought up the other evening about the possibility of city competitively soliciting proposals for, for banking services and we just put that out there to let the council know that the finance director and I are not at all adverse to doing that if that's the council's desire. All right, does anybody interest in doing that? Your Honor? Yes. I move the city council direct the city manager to release a request for proposal for general government KPU banking services effective January 1, 2018, and will and or determine appropriate by the city council. Second. Moved in second. Dick, do you want to add anything? Uh, I don't think so. We kind of talked about it. That's a pretty great cost, and I would almost appear we could save some money if we are successful. So. I have a question for Mr. Dean. You bet. Sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. I, I have a question for you. Is there any way to anticipate at all savings versus the expense of staff time looking at the potential cost savings? Is there any way to, to formulate that? Um, Yeah, it's hard to say we've never gone off an RFP before for the banking services, so I, I actually haven't prepared one. Uh, so there will be a learning curve for us to learn how to use that to prepare one and um, identify all the elements that need to be addressed in the RFP, so that will take some time. As an alternative, we could uh, you know, we could sit down and, and, and talk to our bankers and see if we would be willing to renegotiate uh, you know, the current fees that we're paying for right now. There is a... Um, there's a, uh, a relationship between us and our bankers relative to all of the services they provide. If it's not checking account services, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of other functions that they offer that, that come into play that, that we're paying for. That would be another alternative to an IFP. But either way, whatever accounts we do have to do, we're certainly you know, open to, to doing that. Yeah. Okay. Judy? Have we ever done that in the past? Have we done that recently? No, we haven't actually. Uh, the city's been with um, our current provider way back when it was National Bank of Alaska, uh, long before my time. And so and basically the National Bank of Alaska got bought off by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo just went ahead and assumed the, uh, the banking relationship that, that the city had with the National Bank of Alaska. So assuming... Um, we put an RFP out and we've decided we can get a better price somewhere else. What's the cost of changing that over? Like, don't we have a lot of things that are 
that automatically flow through our bank now and yeah, there would be all some, that stuff. There would be some effort required to, to do that. That's why I suggest we may want to really uh, explore um, a different pricing schemes with our current uh, banking provider. But not having gone off on RFP, I, I can't say for sure if that would be the, the best way to go. Uh, but I think it, it, I'd not like a, to keep it. It's difficult as it used to be because, like I mentioned the last time, one of the biggest costs associated with pushing banks was you had to go out and buy a new check stock. Yeah, I and just. Now we don't have to do that. We have to print our checks on our, our loans of credit. So there's a significant savings right there. I, I guess keep my going. thought is I wonder if we could do that, if we could go to our bank first and try and renegotiate a good, you know, a better deal if that's possible. If we can do that, it would be much more effective if the council would let us go into those discussions, letting the bank know that we expect meaningful discussions or the alternative is to go right. to an RFP. So right. if you approve this, it's not... It's not to me that we we'll to do it. But right. It's a, it's a. But that would be our intent: is to go yeah. to them first, yes. and then this is our. Even if we approve this motion, we could still approve the motion and still right. talk to the bank first. Yeah. It's the first right. step. That just counts as. Because yes. yeah. wouldn't it like just to change over from another bank? You'd just be changing your routing, and the numbers, and then transferring your funds. Right. It wouldn't be the same as you would do like 30 years ago. Like you said, you you don't have to change this. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of, of, of services they provide, like, for example, there's, there's a program called Pocket of Pay that we use to make sure that the checks are presented uh, to the city of Ketchikan or Dallas and all the okay. uh, Those kind of services, um, I'm not sure the other banks can provide it and what would be required to make that make that transition. But you're right, the routing number and the account number are definitely very important. Okay. We'll just take the cash, put it in a suitcase. I'll carry it out. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and Coos will guard you. Okay. All right. Everybody understand what we're voting on? So what we're doing is we're giving them permission yeah. to go out for, what do you call it? They're not going to put a request by phone out, but they're going to go out and review what what that may mean. Is that correct? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. So you, no, I thought they were going I think out they, to they no, the understanding to is. Both. Yeah. That's not my understanding. My understanding is that this is approval for them to put together an RFB if they don't get what they want okay. from mm -hmm. our system. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. 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 Just want to clarify. Very That's good. good. Call the roll. Zingy? Yes. Kuiper? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Flora? Yes. Coos? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. All right, that passes seven nothing. We have no other action items on those, so it takes us back to information technology. Any questions on information technology? I didn't see anything, but you guys might want to look at. <laughs> Small <laughs> English. Yeah. 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 Ready to go to the fire department? Yep. Fire department, we're up. on the operating budget changes for 217 in regards to the training education account 603 where it's increased uh, by $15,120 or by 65.4%. And part of this is due to the start of, uh, it says, uh, tuition repayments for four paramedics. So I, my question was how many paramedics do we have and is there a should we be considering a cap on this type of a program? I don't know. And some of this is, uh, this isn't counting the safety grant stuff, right? 
The, the safer grant comes from someplace else. Abner Hope, Fire Chief. That's that's correct. It does not account for the safer grant, and we do currently with the the class that just finished this year, we have seven. We'll have 17 of our 19 personnel, paid staff, or our trained paramedics. We do have between four and five people who are eligible or nearly eligible for retirement. So we did a, a push recently to ensure we had enough. Uh, certified paramedics to ensure that we can continue the same level of service at the point that those individuals choose to retire. I do expect over the next several years, I don't expect more than maybe one person to do it in a given year, where this year we had four paid staff that did it. We also had two volunteers that completed the program, but those theirs is covered through the SAFER grant, as you pointed out. Okay. And the other thing, and I talked to Chief about this a little bit before, one of the things in the uh, thing is that anything over 5,000 there was an increase in the overtime rate um, that was listed in the changes for 217 because it increased by $40,000 or 21.5%. And my understanding was this has been an ongoing issue and we've done this every year to try to even up at the end of the year so we're probably under budgeting in that program. That's correct. For the past several years we've come back and asked for, for reappropriation of funding in order to cover overtime expenses. Um, and it's been approximately thirty to forty thousand dollars. This year was fifty thousand dollars. So um, I kind of took the middle ground there and asked to increase it by forty thousand dollars so that we don't have to continue to come back and ask for additional funding. But we're, our trend has remained the same as far as overtime use. We're not seeing an increase. It really is a fairly reasonable amount, and, and most of it is due to um, maintaining minimum staffing on duty of four personnel, which is really your bare minimum that, that a lot of departments would argue you should have more than that. But with our operation, our call volume, we're comfortable with four personnel minimum on duty, and then the, the remainder of the, the large portion of the cost is for emergency calls that are very tough to predict. Um, when I talked to Councilmember Sievertson about it, one of the things we discussed is, well, does it make sense to increase our number? And we're not at a point where we could reasonably increase our staffing numbers and, and make up that difference without having probably triple that in cost to increase staffing numbers in order to reduce that $40,000 in cost. So it would cost you $120,000 to increase enough staffing to, re to eliminate the $40,000 in current overtime that we're asking for. Yeah, yeah, just to kind of follow up on that, if you look at the numbers on, oh, what page am I sitting here on? A second. Uh, J6. And uh, in 2015, your actual was right at 203000 then, but we ended up adopting a budget for seventeen what $20,000 less, which probably was wrong. And then we actually we're going to estimate it to spend about two hundred and fifteen, two hundred sixteen thousand, but we jacked it up to two twenty six. So why would we jack it up to more than what we think we're going to spend? Since we've already just because we were we under budgeted, but it appears to me we maybe only need to be asking for about two two hundred sixteen rather than two twenty six. That's just. In, in My 2014, we spent $229,000 in overtime. 2000, what time? 2000, 229000 in, in 2014. Oh, okay. Because in 15, it, was two, it says 203 here, roughly. 203 in 2015. And then 2016, we're at 208000 and we still had a month and a half to go with that yeah. number. So. So we are, but we're, we're going to be around 220 to 225, maybe a little okay. bit higher than that this year. And, no. and that's due to the increased uh, cost of living raises and contraction. Uh, yeah, I'm not arguing about those, but we adopted a budget of 186 for some odd reason, right. which is way less than the average. Right. Okay. We, could, we probably <laughs> should have asked for that increase last year. Anything else on fire? Not until we get the capital. Um, you can talk about the capital. Not to we can do it where we get under the capital budget. Okay. Um, you 
Honor? Yes. One of the things I was looking at is the travel and training, or travel and education, travel and training. And I know that they combine the administration and the operations in this year's budget. Is that right, Bob? Yes. So there, there's some changes there in regards to that. But um, when I look at the performance report, uh, and I don't know if it's, it's completely accurate or not, but it doesn't look like um, you've only used 34% in one and, and yeah, in the administration you used about 74 percent and yet you're still asking for uh, similar amounts is, is is there a defined i guess program that you're paying for or is there just what you think you might have to the, the reason for the change is there in the past budget we had planned to do more travel um, that can be very um, that can create more overtime for one thing, and we haven't had a huge interest in individuals traveling out of state to attend training. So for this budget, my intent is to bring in some trainings, and so I adjusted for that, and that's where you'll also see I did move some of the funding from the travel portion into the training portion um, in order to adjust for that. But under my travel. I plan for, um, we do have a few requests to attend the National Fire Academy, which for that is, is pretty inexpensive training for us because they get uh, reimbursed for the cost of that training, except for their per diem. So I've budgeted for four people to attend that over the course of a year. And then I've um, planned for no more than four business trips and four training events for, um, for that budget item. And uh, those should be pretty realistic. We don't know exactly which classes we'll attend, but we do know of um, some requirements out there. And we typically do about three or four, uh, have about three or four requests per year. So that's what I budget for this time. And then the remainder to do training on site as opposed to sending people out. Much more efficient. And then there was one other item, and it's just a matter of an adjustment, is um, the, the council. Uh, some years back, asked that all the computers be put under <coughs> the 72501, and you have under 72500, you have your iPad and stuff like that, friend cab stuff, and it's just a matter of keeping track of where those things are at. So, it's, it's, it's and that, that description was actually a holdover from last year um, when they started off in 72500. I don't have any any iPads in this budget, it's just that piece of the description okay. didn't get to okay. Okay. Thank you. I would put that under 72501. Anything else with fire? When once, twice, Bob, anything? Um, no. I think that is. All right, let's go to police. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Alan, can you explain to me what the, the CAD interface stuff that you're going to be doing is, is about? You're, you're integrating with other... Alan Bindarchi, please. Uh, we're integrating the CAD, that's a computer, excuse me, computer automated dispatch. Uh, we're using it to interface with Appson. And so, so basically, on when they're generating a call on CAD, it'll automatically download all the uh, references. Oh, okay. And do our record management system. I didn't understand exactly how that was going to work. Appreciate that. Thanks, that was good. Thank you, sir. Anything else for the police department? I was kind of interested. What's the host of Citizens Academy? Oh, the Excuse me? The host of Citizens Academy. What are your goals for 2017? Eventually, the long-term goal is to try and establish a reserve officer's corps. 
Well, this would be the first step in doing that, and basically be presenting to members of the public what we do as police officers. I mean, it's a mini academy of explaining law enforcement and how they interact with the community. Oh, that's cool. I had something about the accomplishments for 2016. I noticed that you deployed body-worn cameras. Do all the police officers have those? We're, everyone has body-worn cameras, correct. And how's that working out? Uh, at this point in time, it's been awesome. It's been very well received. Question mm -hmm. 63506, building and grounds, 450% uh, increase. What's going to happen this coming year that <laughs> change to drive that up? We have a 32-year-old building, and one of the things that, uh, well, we have a capital improvement project for the roof replacement, which is huge. We've also had some maintenance issues with the building itself. Is the roof part of that? You know, I count six thirty five oh six. The roof's three hundred and seventy thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's not even part of the seven. Yeah. It does come out of public works work sales tank. Okay. As I said, we've had some uh, building issues that we're trying trying to update and fix. I can't specifically remember what exactly. Clearly, this last year we obviously spent way more than we expected to. Last year, we, well, we had yeah. emergency repairs on the roof last year. Yeah. That's where so the, that's the huge increase was. So the, the increases over the previous year's expected budget, but not what we spent last year. Correct. Anything else on place? And so, Alan, you're taking a metal, is there a metal cap on that roof or a metal walkway or something that you guys got to remove? Or is that going to go back on? No, there's no metal cap on the roof. Okay. I, th I think when I looked at the narrative, it said something about being a metal. It's a, if I understand correctly, it's a membrane, a flat membrane roof with an aggregate over the top of it. Okay. And metal grains. The phone's 32 years old? Right. I feel old. Yeah. <laughs> there is Seems new to me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, anything for um, police? Yeah. All right, let's go to public health. Thanks, Alan. Go ahead. Can we have a list of the ground renovations that we're going to do to the Gateway Center for Human Services? I know that we still own the building, and, and they're looking at transfer. And I don't know what's holding up that transfer at this particular point in time. Uh, but if I was the, uh, the tenant, the longer I can let the city if I move better. <laughs> but I, I just want to know what, <laughs> what we're looking at. Yeah, Akila is doing. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> it's my hope that you'll either see something at the December 15th meeting or the first meeting in January to affect the transfer and, and start that process with the appropriate ordinances. So it is coming. Excellent. You want to blame the so it's easy. All right. Let's jump the library. Jump to the Jump to the library. Jump to the library. When's our new library director get here? Daniel. He'll not be here until after the first two. Here, I'll. Yes. I just wanted to note something that um, I know we keep an eye on the travel and stuff, but it, one of their goals for 2017 is to have all of the staff attend the, the annual library conference, and that kind of stuck out in my mind until I saw on the following eight pages later they're going to have it here in Ketchikan. <laughs> I thought that was pretty exciting. <laughs> it's going to be here. <laughs> to know more about what they're doing with the education programs for adults. I wonder if that's going to be. 
they're we have somebody here from the library? <laughs> <laughs> we do. Lisa Pearson, Adult Services Librarian and Acting Library Director. Um, we've actually kind of been on hiatus a little bit as far as the adult education programs um, since Linda left at the beginning of June. Um, we have done some basic computer education classes, and by basic I mean this is how you use a mouse. This is how you turn on a computer because there is no way to get that kind of information anywhere else. But our library catalog is an online catalog and has been for about 25 years now. But there is a, a selection of the community that kind of missed all of that. Um, and so we're trying to get them comfortable with that basic equipment so that they can use the library um, with more confidence. And so then, then they can come in and use our public computers and just kind of, you know, practice and experiment and, and learn, which is basically how the rest of us learn. Um, so we'd like to keep continue doing that next year as well. And so that's kind of where our focus is on the adult education. And then we do other things like um, nutrition and yoga and um, just kind of, uh, we did a seed swap and gardening information exchange this last summer where we had about a dozen volunteers from the community who were involved in gardening come and give advice and information about how to do gardening at home and grow your own vegetables. So that's the kind of thing that we're leaning towards is that basic DIY um, self-sufficiency kind of education. Nice. I can teach how to grow pumpkin. <laughs> you actually got one? Yeah. It was twice as big as the last year, but it, I couldn't get it to turn the orange. <laughs> I'm going for it again next year. I have all Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions on library? I just think for the public they should know that when you look at the summaries there are there are negative numbers. Yeah, right. It's not like the limited goal. This covers adult outreach services, children's, first city libraries, UAS library, library building, OIM, and grants. And they don't have much in the way of grants. Okay. It should give up, like, what, awards for the minuses. <laughs> Julie? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yes. I could. Um, one of the things that the library has experienced is that we've had this consistent growth in the use of our um, study rooms and our meeting rooms at the library. So right now we are booked um, both rooms every Saturday all the way through the middle of April um, because we have so many community organizations. We have breastfeeding support group, diabetes education, um, association for the education of young children, um, we have tax uh, help for AARP, um, all of these different organizations in town that previously didn't have anywhere to hold meetings or to outreach to the public, and they've um, really taken to using the museum, um, the library and the library spaces um, to interact with the public and to, to get out more into the community. So that's been a really huge area of growth for us in the library. Has that caused you any issues or extra... Uh, cost or staffing or anything to, to meet those needs? Um, well, it's it's a little bit more time in terms of the staffing, but we see that as beneficial because it brings groups into the library that might previously have not used the library. And what we found is that once people actually get in the building and see what it's like and what we have to offer, they're, they're very pleased with the facility and that they start to come back more often and that they bring family members or friends or visitors um, to the community to show off the library as one of the showcases of the community. So if we can just get them in the building, then once they've seen that and once they see what we have to offer, they're more likely to start using the library on a regular basis. Thank you. Yeah. Does that number of those groups or people in those groups figure into the total number of people that come to the library? Uh, um, not necessarily. So if they use our large meeting room, that's outside of our security gates. And so unless they actually walk through our security gates, we don't count them. And then we also don't monitor the use of that by the organization. So we don't do a head count when it's being used by an outside organization. We keep our own count. So if we do teddy bear picnic or if, for instance, we had um, the... Uh, presentation about Argentina, um, Afghanistan. 
and we had 72 people come to that. And so that's something that we keep account of, but again, that's outside of our, our security gates where the little counter is, so we can't necessarily determine how many people are coming into the building unless so, there's So a that head count of, I can't remember what the number was, 4,000 or so a year, is only those that go through the security gates, and that's a count right there. Right. Okay. And it's not necessarily people that come and check things out. It might just be people that come and use the Internet, or it might be people that just come in to sit in front of the fireplace and knit on the lunch hour, which we have people do that. Mm -hmm. Me and my grandson enjoyed the trains on Sunday. I'm glad you had one. We tried to get a room, and I was, like, really bummed. Because we were going to do a class up there, and they're booked out. Yeah. Any other questions for a library? Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Off to museum. Now, what's the status on our museum director? After the first of the year. <laughs> I forget easy. <laughs> not, not soon enough for those next um, I understand. Who's <laughs> <laughs> going? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of minuses on this one, too. Yeah, Lou, I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, page N2. N2? N2. And I, I may be adding something up wrong here, but right at the top where it says Department Executive Summary, I took in under 2016 estimate and 2017 budget. I added everything up down through grants. I left off capital improvement. On the 2016, if I did this right, I came up with eight hundred sixty-two thousand dollars in two thousand seventeen. A million and forty-seven thousand dollars for a twenty-one percent increase. Is there? Some, I think there's some logic in there, but I don't know where it's at. Why is it? Why did it go up so much? Unless I miss added something. Which page are you on? Which I'm on in. You said in two in this. Yeah, it's actually in one. In one. Yeah. That's, that's right. uh, Oh, it's in one. I'm sorry. I dropped okay. down one. I'm Try, sorry. Trying to confuse us there. It could work. No. <laughs> just trust me. <laughs> it's in one. I dropped down a page. Charles, do you have an answer? <laughs> wherever I'm on. Council Member Coos, I'm sorry. I'm not following. What okay. okay. If look under 2016 estimate and add up the first six lines, 2017 budget, the first six lines, and... The difference between them to me is we've got an increase of 21 percent. If you, if you, I, I left off the error, I left off the major capital outlays. Is that what I did? Let's see. I left off the capital improvement program because that always changes and it doesn't have anything to do with operations. It was collections clear down through grants. Oh, I see. And I think. Um, and, and I, I know that the first two the first two lines are one's a nine point seven increase and one's a thirteen point two increase. So maybe that's well, part of it is under personal services. We're, we're showing the uh, exhibit curator oh. as a full time position as opposed to a half time position because council only approved it for six months in two thousand sixteen. Okay. So, so that's part of it. Well, it's close to two hundred thousand dollars. That's what the difference is, and so, and I, I think I remembered the full time, half time thing, or from one year to the next. Correct. So that's probably fifty thousand dollars there. Maybe not quite that much, but it's probably close with benefit. Yeah, the other piece of that, of course, would be that um, he wouldn't acquire um, insurance and that type of those benefits until after he's completed six months. Um, mm -hmm. So that will be coming up at the basically end of this month. So there would have been some savings there that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't see next year as well. Well, there just, there, like I say, there was about a, um, 
not quite two hundred thousand dollars, maybe one hundred eighty-five difference, and I just it seemed like a lot. So, and I couldn't go through enough of it. Let's just take a look at it. Jog it, jaffer it out. It's probably there somewhere, but I didn't I wasn't able to dig through it. That's true. We, we, we saved on museum director this year. We saved on museum director. So <laughs> don't ask any questions. Any other questions on <laughs> on museum? We go for seven, so. <laughs> that includes programs, Centennial Building, Heritage Center. Anything. Some of the stuff under the capital budget, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And CPV. Capital part of this, or you want to wait till we get to the capital total budget? Makes a difference to me if you have a question. Go for it. Well, I'd have to go back to the back, and because of the capital budget in the back is long term, and just looking at the whole thing, we're plowing a lot of dollars into that museum over a five year period. And maybe that's the way we planned it because it's going to be four to five million dollars before we're done, it seems like. And I'm just I'm concerned about how we afford the years out. Mm -hmm. anyway, like Part of it's so we didn't plow ten cents into it for about twenty five years and we should have. Yeah. So part of this is a lot, a lot of this is catch up. Well, and it's, it's, look look at it and thinking about it, there's the HVA system, uh, air conditioning system, and some other things that. I'm worried that we're going to tear that building up three times trying to fix all those things. Mm -hmm. so if, if, if I, I, I don't can, know. Go ahead. Um, what we use to uh, program those improvements over the five-year period was the uh, report that was sponsored by Four Acre and that Welsh Whiteley did. And the council made it very clear that they did not want to upfront all of those costs in the initial go around and that they wanted them spread out. As the council will review budgets on a year to year basis, those will all be at the council's discretion. We're just trying to show over the five year period what you can expect if you want to fully implement what was recommended by Welsh Whiteley and under the auspices of Four Acre in terms of what needs to be done to the Centennial Building to properly outfit it to, to do a museum. And if I may add to that, I think the one other thing, too, that Public Works has been very diligent about is as Welsh Whiteley developed the renovation plans for the main floor of the Centennial Building, keeping an eye to the future. For instance, when we did the electrical transformer um, earlier this year, having that have the capacity for future renovations was really important so that we didn't waste money going back and having to upgrade that system later. So that's definitely been something that's been forefront um, of the architects and the engineers. We're, we're not going to, we're trying to build upon what we're doing now. We don't want to go back and rip out stuff yeah. two years from now to do a future phase. We're trying to do it in a cumulative mm -hmm. Well, then, I guess one reason I bring this up, and I'll bring it up maybe later, but as we look at our capital budget back there and we look at what it is, and we look at our increasing labor and benefits costs and so forth like that, I see this body next year is, and Carl knows it, and he's told us, you're going to be in a bind. You're going to have to increase some rates or, or taxes because it don't balance out. This may be about the last year this thing will balance out, but I'm just throwing that out there. That's where we are, and I think we've been told. <laughs> I, 
he, he, we didn't told, so we've got to be prudent. And like he said, like Carl said, we may not be able to do them in the year that they're scheduled. We may they, they may go out, or somebody may not be able to do them that year. You're facing that, as you heard tonight, with water and sewer. So yeah, you're, you're, you're right. <laughs> All right. Any last things on the museum before we go to the specifics? Um, go ahead. What are the fees that we charge for um, visiting the museum in the summer? It's free for locals and their guests. Um, the Heritage Center is $5, and the Tapas Historical Museum is just 3 um, Once renovations are complete with the museum, we'll be raising that. So do you know how many visitors we've had like, in the last this last summer, for example? This, basically, to date, we've had about 56,000 folks visit. And we don't, we, we don't know if that, you know, if you go to the museum and then you come to this, this the, the Heritage Center, we count you as two people. Um, so, and we know that, you know, just museum goers tend to, to visit both facilities. But yeah, overall, so far, it's been about 56,000. So if we increase that $2 and then it's probably going to be more um, favorable because of the, the building change. Absolutely. We hope so. We hope yeah. it's more appealing. <laughs> more appealing. <laughs> Dick, did you have something? Yeah, I do, I do have one more question. And one of the capital project items on there is, is um, public art. There's 15000 this year and 15000 the next year. And are we required to put public art in that building? Because my opinion is that's a museum and modern public art. I want to see your. I want to see the historical stuff. I'm not worried about the other part. So, is it a requirement or not? It's it's not a requirement. It's something I thought would be appropriate to be doing the building. I had not defined what the process would be. I know we've had issues the previous process. Um, that's solely a council call. Okay. Did somebody take a shot of skid as an option? <laughs> Our preference would be certainly local artists, and it would be something that we'd want to work in, in continuity with the permanent exhibit, so it was really capturing the history of Ketchikan for our mission. Yeah, you know, I, I want to see the history on, history on a wall, not some modern art, and that's my opinion. I understand. So we'll I'm, deal with it. I'm so disappointed about our water meter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go to the Pacific Center. We didn't know what Ford would be raised for us. That's the problem. The new All right, Civic Center. We need to think on the Civic Center. Not much change at all. comes out of the public works sales tax. There were probably one question. It goes back down to the capital again, and it's, I think I'm on the right page, 09. Repaint the exterior of the building. Maybe I've been here too long, but I can remember that <laughs> building being painted. And, but it maybe already needs it. That's all I can say. <laughs> this was something that was programmed for, for this year. Our former senior engineering technician actually got us a very good price to do it, but his enthusiasm kind of got at odds with the code, and we weren't able to take advantage of that price. <laughs> so we ended up deferring it once we knew we had to replace the fuel tank and the council transferred money uh, for that purpose. So it, it does need to be done. Okay. It really is a need. Yeah. Any questions on that or the tourism and economic development? Then let's call it a night and pick it up on Thursday. You see, you don't want to the tourism and the KBB person is here. Yeah, let's do tourism. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's recall again. No, 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 no. Any questions on that? Oh, or? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any questions on that? 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 Any questions
One of the things about the Ted Ferry Civic Center that I keep hearing over and over again is um, complaints about it not being almost user friendly, like charged for every you know um, plastic bag that puts, and then being charged for individual p uh, kitchen pieces. And I'm just wondering if there's something that could be done where. Um, people feel like they're being penalized for using the facility. I don't know how the rate structure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I think it's pretty standard. You want yeah. to make as much money as you can. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. <laughs> having used it several times and, and for different events and having been on the planning committees, I like that feature because sometimes we don't want to use the extras and have that extra cost. And so I like the feature right. of them breaking it down. Uh, and when we do get... And who are you, young lady? I'm Alice Nelson. <laughs> Thank you. So and what do you do? Manager. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. When we do get someone that comes in, they, we do a use agreement with them, and we ask them, what are you planning to use at the Civic Center? And we do break it out by cost, so they are aware of what those costs are. And mostly they come from, like, we charge for linens because they do go out to the cleaners okay. and that sort of thing. And so if they have questions about that, we, of course, answer them. And we do it in advance just so that they are aware of what those costs are. Any other questions for the Civic Center? Besides the kitchen as a, um, an accident waiting to happen? Well, you can just run by. Oh, I'm sorry. Only when you're in there, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that floor is really slippery. I just. Yeah, we put in um, some mats this year to try and help with that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Looks mm -hmm. like you slide from section to section. <laughs> All right. It's like ice skating. <laughs> Tourism and economic development. I wanted to get through this for Patty, but I guess she's coming back anyway. Thank you, She's a business. All right. Yeah. If I don't hear anything, what I'd like to do on um, Thursday is get through Public Works, Port, and the Capitol at least so we can do KPU on Monday. Okay. But I could be. We're not doing the budget tomorrow, right? That's a mm. specific budget. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Mayor and Council comments. Dick. So move. Judy. Nothing wrong. Jenna Lee. Nothing wrong. Julie. Nothing. Bob. It's winter. <laughs> Dave. The water report just drowned me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Oh. oh, like you're sinking? Yes. I think it was the water report got gotcha. you. Uh -huh. All right. We just Mark. hit the talker. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, I'm glad we had that um, water report. Every time I get more, I mean... They do more of it. I understand more, so that helped me at least. Um, I have nothing else. Do we have a motion to adjourn on Thursday? Move to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. We have a meeting tomorrow noon. Yeah. Oh, yeah.